There are two issues in the life of Martin Luther that are widely discussed as pivotal in the way in which the Christian world changed, or rather returned to elements of its apostolic roots around the time of the so-called Reformation. The first is the marriage between Luther and Katharina von Bora or Katie von Bora. Luther would often affectionately refer to his wife as my Lord Katie. Katharina was previously a member of a convent in Germany. Like many younger daughters, she was sent to the convent as a way of trying to find sustenance in a world that often did not have many prospects for those who would not inherit the estates of their parents. And Katharina received word that a letter had been sent by Luther inviting those to leave their religious vows if they had been compelled by force or by the will of another, let's say by a parent, to seek out their vocation in Christ in the world. Katharina and many other religious escaped in a form of transportation via secret. Um, I believe it was a barrels of fishes. And in doing so, they made their way to Wittenberg. The other nuns were married off, but Katie was the very last. And after Luther agreed to marry her, because it would make his father happy and anger the Pope, they commenced what actually turned out to be a very happy and a very loving marriage. Now, this was pivotal in the development of Luther, and it was pivotal in the development of the Christian West. Clerical celibacy had not always existed. It was a preferential choice for some in the early church, such as St. Paul, who was clearly led to live a celibate life. And there were orders of celibates, even as early as, presumably, the 4th century, and potentially going back further into the 3rd and 2nd. However, it was always seen that the clergy, particularly bishops, as we read in 1 Timothy chapter 3, should have the option of marrying, and most of them did. This changed during the High Middle Ages, and after the year 1000, it was largely seen as a scandal to find a priest or bishop openly involved in the sacramental marriage, although the practice of concubinage, which did not mean necessarily the treatment of women as concubines, but instead the practice of having uh, basically, unofficial wives present uh, was very common throughout the Western world. But there was this deep separation between the laity and the clergy, a vast gulf of separation, and something which was seen as a hallmark of holiness, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Well, Luther, based off of the biblical call to be fruitful and to multiply, and based off of his own love for trying to return back to a scriptural framework, saw an opportunity to open up the office of the priest and of the bishop to family life. Luther loved his wife. And Katie was a strong powerhouse of influence not only the running of their very busy household with, I believe, at least six kids, if not more, but also, too, a voice of counsel, of warmth, and support. Regrettably, to my knowledge, we don't have anything that Katie wrote. But what we do know is that, based off of Luther's marriage, the practice of married clergy would spread throughout Protestantism. And it is a point of discussion even within Roman Catholicism to this day, and is still the practice of all the Eastern churches. Now there was also, too, another great development at this point, one which often goes overlooked. Luther's Reformation 
a splintered Europe. Previously, Christendom had been largely united under the papacy, with periods where the papacy itself could be divided or issues of the investiture controversy over who could appoint bishops or not. But it was largely centralized in the West, in theory, if not always in practice. Now, however, varieties and denominations of Christianity were beginning to already emerge, many of which Luther felt were losing the apostolic character and creedal foundation of his own perceived conservative reformation. And I would argue that Luther's reformation is a conservative and apostolic one, and frankly, a rather Catholic one. But this other great development that had transpired was the arrival of Luther's work throughout England and an intense interest on the part of figures such as William Tyndale to translate the Bible furthermore, not just into a English translation, but into one that was easy and accessible to understand. William Tyndale would take these ideas and present them before his Catholic bishop. It was at that time in London. And of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury gently but firmly refused for fear of conveying some Protestant doctrines into this Catholic English translation. Tyndale had no choice and had to flee the country, chased by Thomas Wolsey, and by my hero, unfortunately, Thomas More, to Germany. There he was betrayed and would eventually be burnt at the stake for trying to translate the Bible into English. But already there begins an attempt to make the word of God accessible for many. Luther's attempts to try to bring the word of God into the language of the Vox Populi, voice of the people, indicates a whole new tendency of encountering God, not merely through liturgy alone, although Luther was primarily focused in reforms of theology and liturgy, but also in one's personal walk and relationship with Jesus. It is this transformative leap of deep intimacy in one's faith, which did exist beforehand, although not in the exact same frame, the printing press changes everything, that allows the arrival of a f form of Christianity, a style of Christianity, which is not dependent only on liturgy and not dependent only on the mediation of the priesthood, but is supplemented and enriched and deepened by one's personal commitment to Christ, mediated through the Word of God and revealed through one's collective and individual meditation on the Scripture. Scripture could previously only be accessed liturgically or instead through the learned class or caste of the priests. Now, the movement of lay spirituality, which pre-existed the Reformation, now took on a whole new shape. As now sola scriptura, the Bible alone, began to become a watch cry for Christianity. We will explore furthermore in the channel how these developments forward would become revolutionary in the ways in which the faith has developed into the 20th and 21st centuries in modern history. I look forward to hearing from all of you in the comment sections, and it is only the beginning. Feel free to leave any critiques or any comments, and I look forward to hearing what you have to share.